The Dinka today are a notable ethnic group living mostly in the East African region of South Sudan. They are known for their pastoral cultures and are part of the newest nation of the world. They are also known for producing the NBA's tallest basketball player, Manut Bull, standing at a staggering 7 foot 7 tall, producing many models within the fashion industry, along with other South Sudanese tribes and peoples. However, we seem to be known as a kind of marginal ethnic group and not much is known about us or our origins. And so I'm going to be telling you guys more about that. And when it comes to Dinka history, most of what is known is a little bit of oral traditions and the Sudanese civil war periods, of course, which resulted in the independence of our nation, South Sudan. And although this is an important part and piece of our history as an ethnic group and of the people of our nation not that much is known before that which is unfortunate oral history is going to be something that's going to be very important for putting together of this story because oral traditions are a very important aspects of african culture and the recording of the history of certain african ethnic groups especially of those communities without any written languages however unfortunately after a certain amount of centuries or years oral histories aren't really considered as reliable because it's kind of similar to like a telephone game whenever you think about it whenever a certain event happens right there's always a thousand different stories about it that come out the same day within the same week and so this is kind of the problem that you go with oral tradition and then once these oral traditions after a couple of generations it's a lot easier for the story to be altered so what you mainly want to look for is things like where oral traditions coincide with say archaeological evidence dna data or when people of different ethnic groups or different backgrounds and different people have oral traditions that point towards the same thing and so this is one thing that we will try to see within telling the history looking at the history of the dinka tribe and so we're first going to be looking into the early history during the late neolithic bronze age there is a place in northern sudan called the wadi hawar also known as the yellow nile it was a river in the northwestern region it was inhabited by multiple nilo saharan speaking communities and now for those of you guys who do not know the dinkas fall under a group of people called the nilos who linguistically are Nilo-Saharan speakers. The areas in which the ancestors of the Nilotic speakers lived was in the lower Wadi Hawar and Wadi El Milk area, closer to the Nubian Nile Valley. This river, the Yellow Nile, would intercept and meet with the Nile River between the third and fourth cataracts. These people pretty much stayed there and traded with the people of ancient Nubia specifically the pre-Kerma and A-group cultures. Pre-Kerma would eventually turn into the Kerma city-state, which would be the first city-state of the Kushite kingdom, ancient Sudan. From this place, people entered into Nubia and its surrounding areas. Of these groups, some of these people were the Nilotic and the pre sermic speakers. But however, due to desertification, migrations between 2000 and 1000 BC towards the central Sudanese area, towards areas like the Jazeera and Kordofan, near and towards areas like Khartoum by the end of these migrations in an event known as the Wadi Hawar diaspora. Later on, we would see archaeological sites in the central Sudan that match that of the Nalotic peoples uh, much later in later centuries. This event known as the Wadi Hawar diaspora was actually a pretty important event because this is where we might have the migrations of the people who would become the Meroitic speakers, who would help establish the Kushite city-state alongside with the earlier previous inhabitants of ancient Nubia. And these people lived in the middle Wadi Hawar. From this events, we have the Meroitic speakers, they help establish the Kushite empire and eventually the kingdoms of Meroe. But also, we have the Nubian speakers who would eventually come and enter into Nubia during the Meroitic period and help establish what would later become medieval Christian Nubia, which we'll be talking a lot more about later on in this video, especially in relationship to the Dinka and what the Dinka were doing in medieval Nubia. It is important to know this because these are the early ancestors of the Nilotes, the people who would later become the Dinka. By understanding this, we can kind of get a sense or feel of their origins. Interestingly, what we can see is that comparing Nilotic tribes to the ancient depictions of Nubians 
during this migration period where they were in between the lower Wadi Hawar, Khartoum, and the Jazeera, we actually see a lot of similarities with Nilotic cultures when it comes to things like hairstyles, clothing styles, even tribal markings, and etc. But it should be noted that there were other different types of Nilo Saharan speakers and sister groups in Nubia, those who would become the Meroitic speakers. They might have shared more cultural affinities with Cushitic people. And so when we see things like skin color, and we see they look like nilotes, but people have certain types of traditional clothing and traditional attires. We should keep this in mind. People with the more traditional nilotic looking thing, they might be the ancestors of the nilotes or people related to them. People who later become the Meroitic people and the people who had founded these kingdoms, they would have had a more Kashidic influence in their culture because those are the people who they eventually mixed with. However, after this migration, we eventually see evidence for the nilotic people in the Jazeera, which is a place just located right south under Nubia and this is a very important historical region for the Sudan because it would house one of the three medieval kingdoms of ancient Nubia which would have been Alodia or otherwise known as Alwa. Not very much is known about Alwa or the kingdom of Alodia but it was first mentioned around the 6th century BC as a kingdom that was on the brink of Christianization. Another mention of this kingdom also was of a Alodian slave girl who was being sold into business in Egypt. What's actually kind of interesting is that this girl might have been sold off by her own kings. We'll get more into that later on. Sites in this area, specifically in the southern Jazeera, during the Meroitic period, so 500 BC to 580, actually showed plenty of evidence of Nilotic culture. Things like teeth evolution, which is the removal of certain teeth in your mouth, and things like semi-nomadic cattle pastoralism, where evidence these people might have been some proto-Western Nilotic group. So we're specifically looking at the ancestors of the Dinka, and the Nuer and possibly the Luo people right here. Now what's actually interesting is that by the end of the occupation phase in this area in the southern Jazeera, this is actually around the time when we have those first mentions of the kingdom of Elodia. This can probably mean is that the proto-western Nilotes might have formed a sort of older tradition of the central Sudanese or Elodian culture because the Elodian culture was actually preceded by the kingdom of Kush and it was actually born out of Kush and out of uh, you know the, the more southern reaches and cultures. Which is actually even more interesting too is that these ancestors of proto-western Nilos or at least this group in the southern Jazeera who might be related to them actually showed plenty of evidence for trade with the Napatan empires and the Meroitic empires and were actually very near stations of trade in the Meroitic empires. They were located mostly just directly south of Meroe. They actually weren't very far from it. Pretty legendary kingdoms, very big kingdoms in the region of Sudan and just in African history as well. I mean, the Napatan Empire was actually was actually the 25th dynasty, the first black Egyptian dynasty as it's pretty much recognized as. Now, when it comes to mentions of people who were ancestral to the Dinkas or the Dinkas in general, we actually get them pretty late. One of the earliest mentions of the Dinka people are from the 13th century, and they're mentioned as a people called the Damadim, living south to the kingdom of Elodia. Their exact location is kind of unknown. The sources are actually pretty vague on their location. Some of the quotes go as follows. Al-Harani from the 13th century actually says, the country of the Damadim, which is who they were called, lies along the Nile above the country of the Zanj. It is densely populated. The Sudans always go on raids into this country, killing and plundering. The Damadim do not care about their religions. In their country, there are many giraffes. It is in this country where the Nile bifurcates, one branch following to Egypt and the other towards the Zanj's country. Other quotes state, among the towns of blacks located in this fourth section, there is the Duma Duma. Once the Damedim people set out against the Nuba and the Habesha in the year of 1220 AD, at the time when the Tartars invaded Persia. For this reason, the Damedim are called the Tartars of the Sudan. So, what we can see from these quotes is that sometime around the 13th century, this group called the Damedim, who were possibly the ancestors of the Dinkas, according to some sources, and others say the ancestors of Luos as well, invaded the Nuba, which were the Elodians, and even the Habesha, which may have been Aksum, or another kingdom specifically 
directly to the east of them. We can see that it was mentioned that the Sudan, which might have been the Lodians, would always go on raids into their country, killing and plundering. And this possibly could have triggered what would later become the Damadim conquest of the Soba of Elodia. They actually sacked Soba, which was the capital of the Elodia kingdom, located very close to the present capital of Sudan, which is Khartoum. Around the same time, the Tartars attacked against the Muslims, and for this reason, they are called the Tartars of Sudan, which is actually a pretty cool name, the Tartars of Sudan. This is when the Tartars invaded Persia, for those of you guys who do not know. Soba was actually the main capital city of the Lodi Kingdom, as you may know, as I've just told you. And it was actually known as a city for its beautiful gardens and beautiful buildings, and etc. There were actually a lot of very good mentions about the city. However, there's not really much archaeologically that we can actually see. We only see like a couple of buildings and churches, and that's pretty much it. But archaeological evidence actually showed that there was a destruction of Soba around this time that was possibly related to the conquest of the Damadim. Two of Soba's largest churches were actually destroyed and rural burials were actually looted. One church was even used as a residence for a certain period of time until it was later restored. But however, this conquest wouldn't last very long. Later we see that in the following centuries, the certain migrations of these people would actually happen specifically around the medieval period. And this is when we see the spread and expansion of many Western Alate groups, such as the Dinka, the Nuer, the Shulug, the Lu people, which are all ethnic groups very closely related to the Dinka people. This is when we see the Dinka actually migrate into South Sudan, which is actually something I forgot to mention. The Dinkas have only been in South Sudan for a little bit. They haven't been, we haven't been in South Sudan for that long. It's actually only in recent centuries that we came to dominate and occupy most of the regions in South Sudan that we inhabit today. Now the Dinka are actually the largest ethnic group in South Sudan. Most of these migrations and expansions of the Western Nilots coincide with the adoption of a new cattle, which is called the Zebu cattle, which actually made it easier for them to be cattle pastoralists in much more drier areas, which actually caused a switch being a matrilineal society, which means that wealth and things are inherited to the, the female line. This actually turned them into a more patrilineal society where, you know, things are now inherited, started to become inherited through the male line. And this happened sometime around the Middle Ages with the adoption of this new cattle and with the expansion of these tribes or these people. Now the migrations of the Dinka tribe out of the Elodia kingdom that they conquered is specifically out of Soba would have occurred for many different reasons. Now during this time the Dinkas would have mostly lived throughout the Jazeera which was the Elodian kingdom. Some of the reasons would have been slave raids from incoming Bedouin tribes that would start to take over and overrun Nubia during the same time period as well as droughts and Elodia's just rapid decline as a kingdom in general. There are actually a bunch of records of negative Muslim attitudes towards the people living in the Jazeera at this time. Now, slavery in the Lodian Kingdom actually wasn't very uncommon. As I mentioned to you guys earlier, one of the earliest mentions of this kingdom was actually of a slave girl being sold in Byzantine Egypt. It was even possible that she might have been sold off by her own king. People known as Ethiopian slave traders were actually very common into the region. The Mercurians, which were another Nubian medieval Christian kingdom that were directly located north of the Elodian kingdom, would often go on slave raids and enslave some people in the Elodian kingdom and then sell them off. In uh, historical records, when they say Ethiopian or Ethiopian slave traders, this might refer to people enslaving others in somewhere around the Meroitic area which include Nubia. But however, this isn't very clear. Interestingly, this is just when we started to see a migration, probably what could be a migration out of the Southern Desert around the 6th century AD, around the time we just have the Nilotic Western Nilots leaving. The name of this girl Atolos, and she was recorded being bought by some woman of high standing in Byzantine Egypt, being sold off by slavers who might have been of lesser standing. Not very much is known about her, but from the text that we have, she ended up getting renamed the Christian name, which actually translated into lucky in the Greek language which possibly indicates baptism of Christianity. Beyond this, not much is actually known about her in her life. It's her accounts of slavery or slave raids in the Jezero or Elodian kingdom would actually be mentioned as slavers coming into the Elodian area and kidnapping little boys. In fact, 
the quotes that we have from how these slave raids were ran are actually pretty stunning. One quote from a 12th century geographer actually states the following. Cunning merchants visit the places to kidnap their children and boys. The merchants go out to the grazing lands of the Zand and hide in the swamps covered with trees, carrying with them dry dates which they throw in the playground of the boys, who scramble to pick them up, find them good, and ask for more. On the next day, the merchants throw the dates to them in a place further than the one of the previous day, and so continue to go further. The boys follow, and when they are sufficiently farther away from the homes of their fathers, the merchants rush on them, kidnap them and take them to their homes. Now this actually runs consistent with historical uh, or with oral traditions of Dinkas of slavery in the region during the time of these migrations. But however, another big thing that caused a lot of the migration was droughts. Droughts were actually a very big thing, especially around this time period in the Eastern African region. You see, droughts were a big thing. Around the same time period in the 13th century, we actually had a huge drought in Egypt. There was actually a huge famine in Egypt around the 13th century they killed up to a third of its population and so what we can see is that the reason for migration in this time from these regions was actually multifaceted there was many different reasons for migrations and this is actually when we start to have the beginning of the Dingas starting to dominate the modern day country of South Sudan which we inhabit today during these migrations the Dingas or the ancestors the forefathers of the Dinkas ran into a bunch of different enemy tribes, to put it simply. Of these people who they ran into, one of them were actually the Funj. And the Funj are a very, very important part or piece of Sudanese history. And I'll tell you why. The Funj actually formed a great powerhouse kingdom in Sudan's late Middle Ages. Being founded in the early 16th century, the kingdom quickly converted to Islam. Their kingdom was established after the conquering of Soba by their great king, Amara Dunkas. However, it is contested that the Bedouin tribes have also conquered Alodia. Now, although they did claim to be Arabs, it was very well known that they were, in reality, black Africans. Some records going back to this time even refer to them as people coming from the primitive southern swamps. These connections are further illustrated or further recognized with connections with the Dinka tribe and the Shuluk. In fact, one of the early Fun sultans by the name of Dekin actually claimed that his brothers were Shuluk, Dinka and Ibrahim and for those of you guys who don't know yes they did claim to be Arabs but also I guess they acknowledged their black African background very confusing right although there is a lot of evidence that suggests more connection with southern Sudanese people their origins are very obscure and we don't actually have a lot of information about them or their origins and so I'd say take certain things with a pinch of salt now while this was going on during the 15th and 18th century the Dinkas quickly expanded throughout much of what is modern day South Sudan to inhabit their modern day territories there have actually been archaeological studies that show evidence for Dinka migrations in certain time periods and there's even a nice map that actually shows the Dinka migrations from the capital city of Soba that they conquered in the 13th century. Other groups of people who we would have interacted or the Dinkas would have interacted with in southern Sudan were also the Shuluk who were actually the only Western Nilots to actually establish an actual kingdom or monarchy. They actually founded the, the Shuluk Kingdom. And the Shuluk, for those of you guys who don't know, are a subgroup of the Luo people who lived in southern Sudan at the time. Oral accounts from the Shuluk actually describe that in the 17th century, they would suffer intense military pressure from Dinkas. These Dinkas would engage in many wars with them. However, it is also mentioned at the time that the Shuluk and Dinka united against the expanding kingdom of Sinar, which were the Funj. Oral accounts report northern Dinka clans successfully invading the Funj people and pursuing them all the way up to places such as in Ethiopia. Oral histories collected by a British administrator claim that the Dinka leader, Awil Longar, invaded the Funj and that he and his son pursued the enemy as far as Shuida Mahi Bay. However, wars with these other groups of people in the southern and central Sudanese region would prove to be devastating for the Dinka. As a matter of fact, the Shulu 
Brooks would later inflict a crushing defeat on the Dinka people. Besides these other battles, we also had groups such as the Luela people who the Dinka would defeat in the more western regions of Sudan. But then later on, just a couple centuries after, we would have the Nuer expansion, which would be another devastating blow to the Dinka people. The Nuer expansion was very brutal. They expanded into much territory which was previously owned by Dinkas. And it is actually said that a majority of Nuer people are of Dinka origins. Some clans or sections actually having people up to 70% of former Dinka origins. And so that just says a lot. Reports on brutal attacks on certain Dinka clans and villages in, during in the oral traditions survive and they actually separated so a Dinka section sending one people up north and one people up south down south. If you want to learn more about that, let me know if you want a full video explaining in detail the Nuer expansion. All of this goes to say that the Dinka have an incredible history with comes to contact with ancient medieval kingdoms of the Sudanese region and conquering of kingdoms just being pretty cool people you're a nomad you're you're a semi-nomadic cattle pastoralist and you go on raids trade with empires and you know you have no ruler <laughs> Uh, I think this makes I think I made this video to kind of help fight the narratives of certain groups of eth uh, ethnic groups in Africa having no history um, worth noting of. And if you want to see if you want to see where I got all of my sources to read more in detail about these events, you can actually subscribe to my email newsletter where I will send you the link to the blog article that I written about the Dinka tribe's history. It is called A Concise History of the Dinka. Um, I might name it this video that same exact thing or just a history of the Dinkas if you are interested in reading any more. I have all the sources listed out with the quotes and everything cool and all of that. So if you're interested in that, hit the link in the description. It will probably be the only link there. And yeah, let me know what you guys think about this video. With that being said though, thank you for watching and come back for the next one.